Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me very well. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be able to speak with you and speak with Rebecca Saunders. My name is Nari Sol. I'm a pianist composer, and I also run a YouTube channel where I explore all kinds of topics regarding music. And I'm here today trying to understand a little more about the creative process when it comes to modern day composition and just share the stage with Rebecca Stondlers. Hello, hi. I think we might just jump right into it. We just heard such amazing and overwhelming music and we got a chance to hear Rebecca's piano concerto. Um, could you say a few words about the idea behind some of the techniques that we heard, the piece as a whole, and your experience hearing it today? Uh, let's break that down, shall we? <laughs> well, I, I, I said a little bit when on the stage um, with Barbara Livich um, that the I, I first um, worked with Nick Hodges in 2004, and um, we've done many projects together over the years. Um, I wrote two so piano solos, a duo for him, so all, uh, all kinds of different things, and a, a double concerto for uh, accordion, piano, and uh, choir and orchestra. Um, but um, this was uh, the first time, um, uh, this is my first piano concerto. I'm so overwhelmed from Dieter's piece, I find it very hard to speak. I don't know how anybody else is, but my brain is completely fried. And it's just such an extraordinary sounds and colors that we heard. It feels very strange to start talking about Glissandi. <laughs> well, we can start being, I try, ooh. <laughs> May I first congratulate you for creating something with the orchestra and the piano and coming from a pianist and composer myself. I've heard of many concertos, I've been able to play many as well, but some of the sounds and the techniques that you were, you were able to achieve with this very commonly used format, um, I've never heard before and I've certainly never seen before as a pianist and what you achieved with that, with such a familiar setup, is so extraordinary. So congratulations Thank to you, you and, and to everyone that performed that, that piece. And if anyone is listening that hasn't, uh, wasn't able to attend the concert, it, it's a monstrous piece full of such a range of expression and it utilizes all aspects of sound, all aspects of space even, because being on, uh, in, the, in the audience, you can really hear where all the sounds are coming from. And I think that experience can't be matched if you're just listening um, separate, uh, no, away that, from the that's stage. That's very true. Mm -hmm. It's the choreography of the sound on the stage, because that's the wonderful thing about working with a large orchestra, is that you can actually map the way the sound moves through the space. Um, for one tiny example is how the solo piano is um, shadowed by the orchestra piano with the harp. So you'll, he'll be playing and then behind you've got like that, or with the tom-toms, and you can actually play with the movement of the sound. Um, you can also, of course, with timbre, you can bring the, just even taking one, one note and um, invisibly um, sewing it in from one note to the next is also really, really fun. But there's that spatial aspect with an orchestra which is very, very special because you just have a hell of a lot of musicians on the stage. When talking about the piano, though, just to get back to you now, I'm beginning to come down from Deep Mouth's piece now. But, I mean, that was amazing, wasn't it? It really was. It was amazing. Um, uh, it, the piano is really the instrument I feel as so, so the most close to because I grew up in a house full of pianos. My parents played the piano. My grandmother played the piano. Grandparents played the piano. This, um, the piano was really everywhere all the time, and it, I, I just. I feel as if um, this life will not be long enough to work through all the sounds and the resonances that I feel uh, in the potential of the sound of the instrument. I also think I uh, want something extraordinary about a piano concerto. You know, before the soloist even comes on the stage, you've got this beautiful, silent animal. Just, it's a statue, isn't it? It's a sculpture. Um, and it, it's inviting you to uh, already you're um, focused and concentrated. And there's a strong theatrical element, I think, about a pianist sitting down at the piano. And before he does 
even, he plays even the first note, uh, you're already completely absorbed in the performance situation. So I, I, I think writing a mechanical concerto is something I left for a long time, but it was something I've always wanted to do. Mm. Yeah. And when you started writing this, how conscious were you about pre-existing formats, um, techniques, sounds that come from the piano that we are all used to hearing? Mm. And creating something that's of contrast to that and that's novel. I, I find that as a composer these days, it, we can't help but be conscious sometimes about what came before. We are always, well, yeah. you can choose to be conscious or you can try and ignore it, but what came before is there. Yeah, you can of course say, um, it, we don't have to invent the wheel again, do we? Because the wheel was made and it's a very, very good invention. Right. You know, and there are extraordinary sounds and techniques which already exist. There are some Listian passages in the piece, I don't know if you did, da, 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 da. there are moments which just sort of subconsciously came out and to give those space and to try those resonances and to put them in a new context or a new form is very exciting mm -hmm. to experiment. But I don't purposely look for novel sounds. I've developed a piano uh, literature, a piano vocabulary over the, over the last 25 years and it's an instrument I've worked on very, very um, uh, intensely um, and created my own kind of vocabulary. I mean, working with Nick, particularly on this piece, we worked on, on, the, on the glissandi, obviously. I've done a lot of work with clusters before and glissandi was something which I felt was like the last frontier, so to, so to speak, or the new frontier, how to break down a cluster. So I'm still blurring the line, I'm still blurring the melodic or the harmonic line, but working with um, glissandi I thought would be a really exciting way to create a piece of enormous energy potential. Um, so I experimented with him with like how fast is a white glissando played um, um, if it's over two octaves? How fast can it go if it's pianissimo? How fast does it have to go if it's forte? Um, and how do we do this? Uh, what part of the hand do you do? So not only does it not hurt, but it feels comfortable. And that's why we developed using these um, half gloves, for example. So you can play on the side of your hand and you can have a glissando of a second or a third or a fifth or a whole hand's worth, you know. What was the process like refining what type of fabric and shape the the gloves were so the pianist had <laughs> gloves on and that's the first thing I noticed I, I did see Nick just now because he can answer that but he's disappeared again so there he is he'll just tell you about the gloves I'm he'll just wondering you if you gloves. tried you know <laughs> wool and cotton no 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 you stay there means I can strangle her from behind for all those things she made me do. Um, Bravo, first of all. Thank you very much. Uh, the gloves are, yeah, I mean, it's an interpretative choice uh, that uh, on each concert they're different, and it's depending on the conductor and the orchestra and the public and the acoustic, and no, that's all not true, obviously. Um, they have to be wool, unless they're fleece. In Italy, in La Scala, I played with fleece gloves, so plastic, basically, and sort of nylon. And the problem with them was they went all over the piano keyboard and, and disintegrated. And then the piano technician came back afterwards and was like, are you OK? Because I'd left all this stuff all over the keys. But basically, they have to have no fingers so that I can play properly. And they have to be smooth. And otherwise, there's no difference. Yeah, but the problem is they run out. I mean, I get big holes in, my, I get big holes in the palms of my hands. I have another question. You use your forearms a lot. Are you conscious of what kind of fabric you're wearing as a shirt or a blazer? Well, the jacket's quite thick. Okay. <laughs> and I don't care about pain, so. <laughs> the price you have to pay to make new music. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's fine. No, I mean, if I may say something, um, the, 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 the thing about it is the joy of it is connecting all these techniques that we're laughing about, the glissandi and the clusters and things, to the harmonies and making the clusters chords and making the glissandi chords as well, which are moving. Um, and connecting those to harmonies and single notes is, is really a challenge and a joy because it's, that's where the composition of the piece is. The composition is not throwing glissandi around the piano. You know? It's connecting that with single notes in the orchestra and, and making, making music with that. Well, thank you so much. <laughs>
I think that's important, actually, just to emphasize that, you know, with the working with the clusters, I've always been tracing melodic lines or two-part melodic lines. So you can have a, a white, a black, or a chromatic cluster, and the top of or the bottom of the cluster, that marks a, a note within a melodic line. And you can expand or, 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 or shrink the cluster, and then the melodic line, this polyphony, can actually then change shape. And that's something I really enjoyed exploring. And with glissandi, I started doing the same. So you have a white note glissandi, which start and end at the key melodic tones, which are taken over in the orchestra, and from which the harmony Many harmonic um, rhythm is then built. So there is a very, um, it isn't, as Nick said, it isn't just throwing down glissandi, obviously it's not, but um, although the, cause the, the cadenza is Nick's, must well, we have to also say. We have to say. How specific are you about the <coughs> tempi of the, sp the speed very, of the glissandi? Very, very okay. specific, yeah, because otherwise it doesn't work. If you have to do a two and octave, two and a half octave white glissando with pianissimo, it only works at within a certain very small tempo range. So that's very, very clear and precise because it always has to be comfortable and it has to flow. And I think part of the joy is it. I mean, you can see how Nick played. I mean, he's just dancing, you know, it's so central the way he's moving and that's what I really, really want. I want the physical, um, I want the joy of the physical um, movement behind the sound to be not only seen but to be felt, you know. Uh, going back to the sense of space in your piece and also the performance setup, what I found was fascinating is that you utilize the piano and the orchestra in a way that highlighted an aspect of the piano that I always felt was a bit uh, limiting because once you play the note, you have no control of what, what happens afterwards. And you utilize elements of the pedal where certain notes ring out um, and extend and, and resonate after what was just heard, but also some notes, some pitches, some textures that you hear from the orchestra complement what just came from the piano. And sometimes they're in sync with each other, but sometimes it's almost like you know, handing off the baton of sound from one instrument to the next. And you can, going back to space, just feel it moving from, from one spot on stage to the other. So I, I thought that was really, really great. And that's really fun to compose like that. Also, you can make a very clean line moving the sound, or you can blur the line, or you can smudge the line, and to, explain, uh, to explore different, different um, levels of that as well. I mean, you've got, there are so many different um, um, aspects, which, or, or levels, I suppose, or surfaces, which feed into making a, a composition of that complexity. And one of them um, is, is also tracing this melodic line. Um, yeah. Besides these details that you mentioned about the melodic lines and the clusters and the techniques, what is the type of groundwork that you do before writing a piece like this? Well, work, well, because I knew I wanted to explore the glissando specifically, and I'd already built up a large vocabulary of sounds that I really wanted to use together with the glissando, um, I met with Nick and Steinway House twice, and we actually just worked at these glissando. And I, we, no, we met once there for a long session, and then we had a rehearsal for another piece. Um, and um, I asked, and I had sketched um, several passages for the solo piano and tried things out and started to really um, develop uh, well, the, the, what was really important was to develop a notation which was extremely uh, economic and precise. And with that notation, then to actually move on further with the sounds themselves, because composition is also here, but it's also extending a notation. There's that other, other, other level as well, and the notation has to be very, very precise and very clear, so that the pianist, even though he seems to be playing very unusual and conventional sounds, they're still very strongly based upon the classical um, notational tradition. So a musician um, recognizes that immediately. So that was super important. And basically, I just wrote like seven very long passages for the piano and uh, sat down, I mean, which is what I mostly do. I prepared um, uh, the percussion palette. Uh, it was very clear for me that I had to build up a, a palette between the orchestral um, piano, the harp, and the orchestral percussion, and several gestures, um, or kinds of gestures, or units, or um, elements of gestures, I, I create, I sort of set up to start with. So I had like kind of tumbrel palettes which were established to start with. I, I wrote a series of harmonic chords which all very closely related to each other, um, and had central tones on central tones or chords within each of these um, piano, seven piano solo lines that I had written. And then I stuck it all on the wall and started on page one and wrote the piece. So, 
And when exactly did you write this piece? I wrote it um, from the end of 19 through to the end of April 20, so in the lockdown, basically, first lockdown. And how, how is this piece different or similar from your other pieces? I don't, can't answer that. You can't answer that. How come? <laughs> I hope they're all different from each other. No, I do know that, I mean, my pieces are, are, there, there are only the recognizable um, um, tumbrel, uh, palettes and gestures or expressive uh, mechanisms perhaps which are recognizable in my music. Um, I think what's different in this piece is the piano concerto. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's very much a piece about the piano which is embedded in the orchestra which disappears and resurfaces um, and it's the only piano concerto I've written so obviously it's different from the other ones. I think it's so fascinating how from piece to piece and I'm only beginning to know your, your works, your other works, um, you almost create a completely new set of rules, new set of um, just the way sound works, uh, maybe in terms of the physics of sound and how dense each sound is and, and what different pitches represent and what textural elements are, are more in focus. I, I just find that from piece to piece, it's so vastly different and uh, you're, you're able to just recreate a new format. And I was just wondering if, um, from piece to piece, that's something that you're very conscious of and you're building a sound world prior to putting the notes down for the musicians. I, I think in every piece there has to be something, uh, has to be, it's really important to have uh, a major new challenge that you set yourself, to be asking yourself a very specific question and to be exploring something which you've never explored before. Um, it's incredibly important for me not to know what the piece will eventually be. And through asking those questions and setting up uh, a, almost a formal dilemma to seek a solution with the material I have chosen. Mostly, but not always, but mostly the piece that then uh, that unfolds when I'm, while I'm writing um, is, is, um, is like the, the answer to, to, that, to, that, to, to, the, to, to this formal dilemma. It's very hard to explain. I mean, composing yourself is a process of looking, of seeking, of exploring the potential of the sounds you're using. And it's super important. Basically, I think the most important thing is to choose a material which is so exciting, has so much potential to go in so many different directions, to take a sound and to zoom right into the substructure of the thing, uh, to zoom out from it, to, to look around to, at it from all different permutations, to frame it in all different kinds of ways, to, to um, obscure it in density, or to make it incredibly transparent, just to take diddle -dum, diddle -dum, diddle -dum. That's it. Yeah, and say, what can I do with this thing? What kind of energy potential does it have? What happens if I turn it on its head and become something completely lyrical or static or very, very quiet? Uh, and to play, play around with the material. So I think the starting point is to discover a material that just, um, with which you can obsess, which excites you, which drives you, and which you feel such passion about, and then to explore it. And it's extraordinarily fun to do that, you know? I. I it's, it's amazing to hear your perspective of that because I was just about to ask you as well, what are some of the challenges as a composer having to um, lay out certain instructions for the musicians to kind of join you in your vision of this exploration of a, a certain sound or a certain texture? The most important thing is the relationship with the musician. Um, as something I feel very strongly about, there's no hierarchy there. We are in a relationship, um, and working with a musician is an extraordinary privilege, and it's an enormous responsibility. Um, I love to work with musicians because it's just necessary, it's important to develop a notation which they can instantly recognize and work with. So they're using their instrument, perhaps in rather unconventional ways, where they feel they're being pushed to certain limits, but they still enjoy it because they're exploring a different part of their virtuosity. Um, there, are, there is so much you can do with an instrument. Musicians love to be challenged, they love to be pushed, but it still has to be physically possible, and it shouldn't hurt. Mm. <laughs> it shouldn't hurt, that's and a, it's fun, a good you know, you have, Yeah, well, I mean, just, you know, there, there's no blood on the keys, it's okay. <laughs> it's like, no, but um, it's, I mean, working with musicians over all of these, these years is the most important thing, you know, and to remember as a composer, you too are a musician. You are living, breathing musician, and you are making music. They are making music this evening, and I was making music beforehand, but we're all part of the same process. 
I think one of the advantages of having a, a living composer um, accessible during rehearsals and during this whole process is that you have direct um, direct feedback of where this is coming from, how to refine elements of performance. And this is, this is so unusual for most musicians. Uh, depending on what you're focusing on, the majority of what you write, you don't have access to uh, the composer and you can't ask questions. Uh, but on the other hand, there's a disadvantage that I see that some composers are free of. And that is the, the fact that we don't have that much time to repeat certain pieces. I mean, how often do you hear new pieces? They're, they're premieres, and maybe they're a world premiere, and then it becomes a premiere in this particular city. And even though a, a piece, even if it has many rounds of performances, it, it still doesn't compare to having decades, centuries of performance practice related to a piece where by now, if you are performing Beethoven, Brahms, Bach, you have so much in the archives of, of tradition that has led to how it's performed now. And there's a, a significant advantage there. Do you feel that as a, a, some kind of limitation as a composer? Um, as a new composer uh, myself, I haven't been composing all of my musical life. I started first as a pianist. But it, this is something that I'm increasingly aware of, just the fact that, oh, you know, it's so common for us composers these days to just have one or two, maybe if it's, if we're fortunate enough, have five or six um, in a, a given season. So do you think about that at all? Uh, you ask a lot of questions in one, yes, though, I'm don't <laughs> There's just so, much, so little time, so much to ask you. But I think as a, from the perspective of a performer, that's really, really interesting. You know, you do not have centuries behind you, but w you're working with musicians. You know, as a composer, I work with musicians, so we have a relationship in the here and now. And of course, once a piece has been premiered and played a few times, or if there's recordings, then people have to, and I have to let go of the piece, and people have to make a, have a fresh attempt to make their own new interpretation of a piece. And it's interesting, if I listen to a piece which has been formed, uh, performed over the last 20 years, it changes too, because the musicians change. Uh, the sounds they are accustomed to working with, the, thing, uh, the sounds which maybe 25 years ago was unusual to write split tones for the trumpet, now everyone learns them. It's just normal, which is so weird, you know, because Peter Evans was the first person who ever even touched one, you know? And it's like there are... I didn't are know that. <laughs> and, um, yeah, he still does. I mean, I mean, he does even other things with split tones. But, um, but, you know, it's very interesting. There are now pioneers... There has always been pioneers in, uh, for each instrument um, exploring and pushing the frontiers of their instruments. And there are always, um, and very often, composers at their sides looking with them and searching with them and exploring with them. There's this level of experimentation uh, which is so exciting, and that's a big plus, something extra that we have on top, because um, we are making music together all the time. So yeah. It's an incredible privilege to just be able to chat with you about these things and to hear your piece and to share it with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you.